afternoon to our guests in North America and good early morning to our guests in Asia. A warm welcome to the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada's online Asia Leader Speaker Series with J. Michael Evans, President of the Alibaba Group. The event today is titled Navigating the China Market Post-COVID-19. Mesdames et Messieurs, bienvenue à la série en ligne de la Fondation Asie-Pacifique du Canada, série des conférences des dirigeants d'Asie. My name is Christine Nakamura, Vice President of Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada's Toronto office and your host for today's event. Before we begin, on behalf of the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada, I'd like to acknowledge that the places Canadians call home are the traditional territories of many First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples. I'd now like to briefly go over a few housekeeping points. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our website after the event. Please submit any questions you may wish to ask the speaker in the Q&A box. Time permitting, we will do our best to answer as many questions as possible after his presentation. Feel free to contact us offline should we, should we run out of time and not answer your question. For technical support during the session, contact events at asiapacific.ca. And we have scheduled one hour for today's event. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce our board chair, the Honorable Pierre Pettigrew. Pierre served in successive federal government uh, cabinets during the 10 years after being elected to Parliament in 1996. During this period, he assumed key ministerial posts, including foreign affairs, international trade, and international cooperation. He continues to share his expertise on international relations as Executive Advisor International at Deloitte Canada and on a number of public company and not-for-profit boards. He holds a BA in philosophy from the University of Quebec and a master's in philosophy and international relations from Balliol College at the University of Oxford. It's my great pleasure now to invite Mr. Pettigrew to make opening remarks. Pierre, the mic's yours. I think we're having a bit of technical difficulties with uh, Mr. Pettigrew, so I may just jump in here and um, make some opening remarks on behalf of Mr. Pettigrew, if, that, uh, if I may. Today's session marks the fifth online event since the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada launched this online series in early May. So far, we have featured experts from jurisdictions in Asia that have performed well in containing the coronavirus and managing the economic impact of COVID-19 in their regions without having to impose total lockdowns. And last week, we focused our attention to the situation in Canada with members of our foundation's Asia Business Leaders Advisory Council for the benefit of our Asian friends and partners who have economic and commercial interests in Canada. Today, we will switch our focus back to Asia, to the second largest economy where COVID-19 first surfaced. Population density in Canada is four persons per square kilometer, compared to China's 145 persons per square kilometer. The potential for human transmission of COVID-19 in China is therefore far greater. However, Canada has now surpassed China in the number of infections by over 13,000 as of yesterday, and has almost doubled the number of deaths. China, including in Wuhan, COVID-19's first epicenter, has lifted its emergency measures and its economy has been reopened since late April, albeit with stringent protocols of mask wearing and social distancing enforced in workplaces and public areas. And China continues to closely track the movement of people using high and low tech measures. In previous sessions, we heard about the effective approaches employed in Taiwan and South Korea, which did not impose total lockdown measures. But as we reopen our economies, it is important to examine lessons learned in China, where total lockdown was imposed to an even greater extent than in Canada. In Q1, 
China's GDP shrunk for the first time in decades due to the economic shock generated by COVID-19. China is showing signs of gradual economic recovery and its exports have been seen a modest rebound. Consumer spending, however, is key to economic recovery as we all know. And in China, like in other jurisdictions, consumer spending other than on essentials has not really rebounded given the widespread uncertainties and fears of a second wave of infections. Needless to say, brick and mortar retailers, majority of which are SMEs, have been the hardest hit by COVID-19. But it is, it is encouraging to note that retailers who pivoted to sales via e-commerce platforms like Canada's Shopify and China's powerhouse Alibaba are surviving and in some cases have seen their sales surge during the pandemic. Sales of essential products, whether food or personal protective equipment, PPE, have done extremely well. Some retailers, manufacturers, and distributors are in the enviable position of not being able to keep up with the demand for the products. Shopify, Canada's top e-commerce enabler, has seen its shares soar since lockdown, pushing its 2020 gains to more than 90%. In May, Shopify surpassed the Royal Bank of Canada to become Canada's largest company by market value. And darn, I was planning to buy some shares in January, but I missed the boat. Today, we have an opportunity to hear about how Alibaba has and continues to fare with COVID-19 to hear about trends and changes in consumer behavior experienced in China, as well as projections about the future of e-commerce post-pandemic from Alibaba Group President Michael Evans. So enough, uh, and I, I apologize for the technical difficulties, but I hope everybody looks forward to the uh, informative presentation and robust discussion on how platforms like Alibaba will affect consumer spending habits as we move into the new normal. Thank you so much, Christine. I do apologize for the glitch. For whatever reason, I had to re-enter the Zoom link. Um, it, I just disappeared from it, so I couldn't unmute myself. But I do want to thank you, Christine, and I want to thank you, Michael Evans, for joining us today and welcome you very, very much to the Asia Pacific Group. Thank you so much. Okay, so now um, I'd like to say a few words. I know that um, everybody has seen Mr. Evans's bio, which we distributed with the invitation, but I'd like to make mention of a few more points about him. For those who follow the Olympics, and I certainly do, you may remember the 1984 Summer Games in Los Angeles. It was a notable Games for a couple of reasons. One, it was boycotted by the Russians, if you'll recall. Maybe some of you are too young to remember. But in retaliation for the US-led boycott, which included Canada, of the Moscow Games in 1980. And two, Michael was a member of the men's eight rowing team that took a gold, one of the 10 golds that Canada won at those Games. So yes. Michael is a Canadian, born and raised in Toronto. Canadians are proud of his accomplishments in sport, but also we are very proud that he heads up one of China's powerhouses, the Alibaba Group, a sustaining member of China's tiger economy. Before joining the Alibaba Group in his current position, he became a member of the Alibaba Board when the company went public in 2014 in one of the world's largest IPOs. In his capacity as president, he is responsible for setting Alibaba's international growth strategy and implementing the company's globalization efforts. Before join, joining the Alibaba Group in 2015, Michael spent 30 years in global finance and most of those years at Goldman Sachs in various capacities, including as vice chairman of the Goldman Sachs Group from 2008 to 2013. He serves on the board of directors of Barrick Gold Corporation, is a trustee of the Asia Society, and a member of the, Divider, of the Advisory Council for, for Princeton University's Bendheim Center for Finance. Uh, 
Michael holds a bachelor's degree in politics from Princeton University. So with no further ado, I'm pleased to present to you J. Michael Evans. Michael? Uh, thank you, Christine. I just want to make sure uh, people can hear me. Yes, we can. Great. So thank you, Christine. Uh, thank you, Pierre. Uh, sorry about the technical difficulties. Hopefully uh, the rest of this will go smoothly. Um, good afternoon and good morning. I guess so there are some people from Asia who joined, so thank you for getting up early. And I very much appreciate the opportunity to speak to the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada. Um, it comes at a, at a sort of a timely moment in terms of both pandemic, but also in terms of escalating geopolitical tensions between China and the US, but also China and the rest of the world. So I thought what I would do is give a very brief presentation. I've got a few slides that talk a little bit about uh, Alibaba and who we are, since we may not be familiar to everybody on the call. Uh, secondly, talk a little bit about the pandemic um, and how it's changed our business particularly for uh, consumers and merchants. And then finally talk about the types of things that we've done as a company um, that well, I guess would fall into the category of social responsibility in terms of looking after our partners and our merchants and brands and consumers and the people that are on our platform that in part make our success possible. So if we flip to the second page or the second slide, here you'll see a, a very interesting picture. This is a shot. Um, Jack Ma, the founder of the company, is the one that's standing uh, on the right as you look at the screen. And this is the original group of 18 founders of, uh, of, uh, of Alibaba back in 1999. And, and this is one of the few pictures that actually hangs in our museum um, in Hangzhou, uh, because most of the museum is dedicated to the future, not to the past. But these 18 founders together uh, cobbled together a very small amount of money, about $54,000 between them to actually start what was then called Alibaba.com, which was the B2B business. And Jack had just come back from a trip um, to the West Coast where he'd, he'd been meeting with uh, other entrepreneurs and uh, was hoping to raise some money. He met with 20 or 22 uh, venture capital firms. They all said no. They weren't going to fund Alibaba. They weren't going to uh, put any money into it. So he came back and he said to these founding partners, listen, I want you to give me what you can, but keep enough money aside for your family and for your children and, and for their education and things like that. But let's pool the money that we can, put it together and start the company. And that's how Alibaba started. And for quite a long time, Jack ran it out of his apartment. That apartment still exists today in Hangzhou and we use it for training because we think that what happened in that apartment in terms of the inspiration from Jack, but also from his uh, co-founders is a great place to send new businesses um, and new business people in our, um, in our ecosystem to hopefully reflect and come up with the next generation of great ideas. So this picture is a very, very important symbol, both of our culture, but also the history of how things got started. If you flip to the next slide, this is Alibaba today. And this is just one of many campuses that we have. This is our Hangzhou campus. It's lit up because this was for our 11, double 11 festival, our global shopping festival, which I'll touch on in a minute. But the business has become much bigger since 1999. This 20 years on, we just celebrated our 20th anniversary. We had all, um, at the time, 88,000 employees <laughs> were huddled into one stadium uh, to celebrate that last fall. And it was a fantastic event, but we realized how far we've come, but our mission is to, has remained the same over that last 20 years, which is to make it easy to do business anywhere for small businesses, for large businesses, and for consumers. So the B2B business today has significantly expanded, but we've also added many, many other businesses, and I'll touch on those in a minute. If you go to the next slide, just a quick snapshot of some of the things that we do and who we are. We've just passed this year, in fact, we just announced it three weeks ago uh, at our board meeting to announce our uh, fiscal year-end results, but we've passed a trillion US dollars in sales. The number itself is not as interesting as the fact that 90% of those sales happen on a mobile phone. So people have completely moved away from laptops and home computers and do pretty much everything 
on a mobile phone. You can see our revenue and net income and market cap information. Again, interesting because it's large, but much more interesting are the 846 million highly engaged customers on our platform. And I say highly engaged because they spend on average about 25 minutes a day in our app. And that means that they probably open it at least eight times a day. And this is a very important feature because we are not a place, Alibaba is not an ecosystem that you go to necessarily just to buy things. We think of it as a lifestyle app. And you'll see in a minute what I mean by that in terms of all of the services and opportunities that a consumer has to live within our ecosystem and in our app. We have about 12 million merchants on the platform. We started as a small business in 1999. Small businesses are the foundation of our success. We love small businesses and what we're doing in Canada and the United States and around the world, but also of course in China is to look after small business. We love the little guys because uh, the little guys do a lot of great things. We, you'll see that we're investing 15 billion US dollars in frontier technology. What does that mean? Those are technologies for the future, and I'll mention a couple of them in a few minutes, but things like new retail and quantum computing and um, lots of uh, developments in artificial intelligence. These are great technologies for us to use, not only for our platform, but which we wanna make available to small businesses, to large businesses, um, and, and, and even to our competitors or, or to people who want to be on our platform and develop their businesses. We're a huge importer of goods. So you see the number 200 billion is what we expect to import over the next five years. We have a huge consumer business uh, and a huge consumer base. The 846 million people that are on our platform, we aspire to get that number to at least a billion or larger in the future and China has really changed. People still think of it as a country that is manufacturing oriented, a manufacturer to the rest of the world. And it will be a manufacturer to the rest of the world for a, for a good deal longer. But it is also the largest consuming country in the world now. And these consumers love international products, particularly from North America, because they're safe, they're high quality, they're well priced, and they're beautifully made. So the import business for us is a huge part of our overall success and the way that we serve the Chinese consumer. We've got 30 offices around the world. We build businesses in Southeast Asia and South Asia and India, Russia, um, Turkey, um, and those are local platforms. So those are local businesses uh, that where we're looking after local merchants and looking after local consumers the same way we do in China. And we have about 110,000 employees most of which are in China, but about 22,000 of them are now working outside of, uh, of China. So if you go to the next slide, this will help you understand a little bit more about our ecosystem. And I wouldn't try and read everything that's in every box. Let me try and frame our ecosystem so that you understand what I meant when I said we're more of a lifestyle app than we are a place where people go to shop. In that upper left-hand quadrant where you see core commerce, those are all of our core co our commerce platforms. Some of them are in China, Lazada's in Southeast Asia, Trendyol's in Turkey. You'll see Alibaba.com, that's a B2B business, that Taobao and Tmall are B2C businesses. So, but they're all basically integrated so that a consumer, if they want to buy things, can go to the core commerce platform and find whatever they want. We have about 2 billion products that consumers can choose from. Right below that box is the second uh, group of businesses, which we call new retail. And the definition of new retail in our ecosystem is where we have integrated an online and an offline business and digitized the offline business. So a merchant, for example, could be on our platform digitally, but we would also digitize his offline operations so that inventory and the consumers can have the experience wherever they want, whenever they want. In the post-COVID-19 environment, this may be one of the most fundamental shifts that takes place because digitized offline businesses can operate when they're closed. And that would have been very useful for businesses all over the world, offline retailers all over the world uh, during COVID-19. In the upper right-hand quadrant, you see our digital media and entertainment business. This is everything from music to movies, to books, to short videos, 
all of the things that people love to experience everywhere else in the world, you can also experience on our platform. And then you see a series of things in the bottom box called local services. They include food delivery and maps for cars, digital maps for cars and movie tickets and in-store dining and all of those types of offline services, local services that are customized for what people want all across China. When you put all of those four groups together, that's what uh, those 846 mobily sophisticated consumers are tapping into on a daily basis. That's why they're spending 25 minutes on the platform. But in order to make those four groups of businesses work, you see all the enabling services down below. So you have to have payments because people have to buy things and they have to be digital payments. So that's Alipay. You must have logistics because we'll ship a hundred million packages a day. But if somebody orders something, they expect to get it the next day or in two days. We need to be offer, offer brands our advertising and data management because they're spending money on our platform to increase awareness of their products and also generate new consumers. And all of these other services in terms of digital maps and navigation and traffic information make a consumer's life easy if they're moving around or traveling within China. And finally, all of the data and all of these businesses run on our cloud. And within, without cloud, we wouldn't be able to manage the scope and the scale of this business. So if you go to our next slide, I want to draw your attention to something that I think many of you might have heard of, which is our global shopping festival. And it's one of two big events that we do annually. The other one is coming up as well. It's uh, called 618, so June 18th. And these are uh, super uh, sort of um, sale days for hundreds of thousands of brands um, to all of our consumers. And this is something that started, um, actually our current CEO came up with this idea in 2009. And when we first started it in the first year, we sold $8 million of product and there were about 27 brands involved. As you can see last year, uh, when we did this 2019, we sold 38.4 billion US dollars of product in a single day. And most people are astounded by that number. Um, first by its size, but also what is the capacity of the systems that are required to generate that much volume, whether it's in logistics, so we had to deliver 1.3 billion packages, or whether it's in our cloud and our payments business, where you have to be able to process at the peak 540,000 orders per second. So we see 1111, the Global Shop Shopping Festival, it's a tremendous opportunity for our brands and for our, for our consumers, both international brands, but also domestic brands. But it's also a chance for us to test the capacity of all of our systems to make sure that as the business grows and it will continue to grow, it is capable of withstanding the loading that we see in the future. And we expect the business to get much, much bigger. So if you go to the next slide, just give you a few insights on, uh, yeah, that one, on some of the consumer and merchant um, behaviors. And this is, this is very interesting. So during 11.11 last year, one of the areas that we were really focused on was to develop the rural parts of China. So the tier four, five, and six cities and rural areas. And so you can see 54% of total GMV came from consumers in those areas and 57% of those consumers purchased an international brand. So what's true in the tier one, two, and three cities now appears to be also true in the lower tier cities in the rural areas, which is demand for international products, imports, is very significant. And on the right-hand side, you can see with the brands and merchants that we have over 200,000 brands participate in this, 22,000 of which come from international countries all over the world. And we have enormous demand for their products. So you can see 15, 15 brands exceeded over a billion of GMV, billion RMB of GMV in a single day. So this is, this is a great educational exercise for us and for brands about what is the status and the health of the consumer in China? What do they want? What are they interested? It's a huge opportunity to introduce, as you can see, one million 
new products where people are just saying, hey, let's try it, let's see. We have, we have the consumer's attention in China. Moving to the next slide. Before somebody asks the question, I'll answer it, which is what are we doing in Canada? Canada is actually is a small country in terms of the consumer base, so we don't have a local business, but we have over a thousand brands from Canada on our platform. You can see some of them in the middle in terms of Arteryx and Lululemon, obviously Canada Goose, Ports, Jameson, but we have another more than a thousand brands that are participating on our platforms and they're selling their products directly to consumers. That business grew by about 44% in 2019 and year to date has grown by 30%. So COVID-19, the Chinese consumer, Canadian brands, even with all of the geopolitical issues between Canada and China, demand for Canadian products, high quality Canadian products remains strong. The top selling categories you can see at the bottom. And, and for those of you who are watching who are not on our platform, I had a conversation yesterday with someone from Canada who um, I won't mention what the business is, otherwise you'll know who it is, but um, they're not yet on our platform, but will probably come on our platform soon. But anything from fashion and apparel to clothing, to beauty, to vitamins, to mother and baby products, uh, electronics, 3C, all of these things that are manufactured in Canada in high demand. Um, okay, if you go to the next slide, really the last two slides, I just wanna talk about the pandemic impact and, and what we saw and what we've seen. What, from, a, from a China perspective, all of our people are back to work and business is really quite back to normal. I would disagree just a little bit with Christine's characterization of the consumer because we've got about more than half the country are our consumers. I would say consumption has come back quite strongly. Certain categories, um, auto parts, home furniture, uh, luxury, have been a little slower to come back. But other categories like groceries and FMCG products have performed very, very well. So from a brand and a merchant standpoint, what's really happened here is that they've realized that the cost of the pandemic was that most of them had to go home and close their businesses. And because their businesses weren't digitized, that basically meant that they weren't able to do anything. So we've seen an accelerated rate of merchant onboarding, which is to say to digitize the merchant so that they could make online sales to the extent that their offline business was closed. And I think that COVID-19 has basically accelerated the digital transformation of enterprises and organizations. And we can give you some examples of this, but I mean, the work that what we've seen in public cloud, for example, is that the video that is now being uploaded, video is being used as a sales tool all the time um, by merchants, the video uploads have been significant, for example. But more practically and understandably, online education and online work from home has been a huge part of the digital transformation that's happened. So a business like Ding Talk, which is, uh, think of it as a, a, not a social app, but it's an enterprise software. We had 150 million users of that and we were educating most of the public schools in China during the COVID-19 epidemic. So that was never what Ding Talk was uh, meant for, but it sort of became like Zoom which is it became a very stable and useful network in order to take on a new application. From a consumer standpoint, <clears throat> consumers have been forced to adopt a different lifestyle. Most of them have been at home for eight or 10 weeks or even longer. Um, they're no longer able to travel. Um, last year, more than 145 million Chinese people left the country to travel around the world. This year, it will probably be a fraction of that or zero. But the repatriation effect is all the money they were planning to spend on their travels is now being spent in China. And the effect of that is much of it is being spent digitally on our platform. I mentioned the online education and the healthcare and working. This has been a huge, uh, this has been a huge uh, part of every country's um, uh, reaction or ad adaptation to COVID-19, also true in China. Nobody wants to take risk with children. So they were all educated at home through our networks and through others. 
And I think the one that's most interesting to me is that senior citizens or older people who typically would not have used a mobile phone to buy anything, but may have been in the category of consumers and, and citizens who were most at risk, actually started to buy things online, particularly groceries. And that we notice as, as, as people have come back to work, that has continued. So these things are actually quite positive. They're not what, we wouldn't have asked for the academic, uh, epidemic in order to allow these things to happen, but having had it and dealt with it, these things have happened and have been quite positive. Categories I touched on before in terms of some things have gone down, but many things have gone up. And I think that probably the biggest concern that we've had is really around supply chain. Because 12 million businesses, small businesses on our platform, many of the people went home. They didn't have the technology. They didn't have the information. They didn't know how much risk there was. Their employees were very concerned. So we've had to work very, very hard with those small businesses to bring them back in to the business to make them feel com comfortable that they can start up and get going again in order to grow, but also to be the critical link in the supply chain of products that they're providing for sale on the platform, both domestically and internationally. So if you go to the final slide, we just want to touch on social responsibility and, and the business customer support programs. This is something we took very seriously from the beginning of uh, the pandemic. Jack Ma was directly involved in this. And Jack, the Jack Ma Foundation, the Alibaba Foundation made donations of PPE and equipment to 150 countries around the world, including Canada, where we sent 500,000 face masks and 100,000 test kits. And we were early on this um, and managed to, because we have the logistics capability, we did it with our own logistics capability and we did it with our foundation money. And some people interpreted this cynically as a PR exercise. PR exercise does not usually in, uh, include 150 countries. This is a real commitment to an understanding that at a time of great need and, and a great manufacturing capability, it was a good thing for China and for people like Alibaba and led by Jack Ma to basically help the rest of the world. And he did, and we did. Um, we also spent a lot of time vetting and sourcing PPE because there were the usual problems in terms of quality that you would expect. Um, and so we worked with governments, both uh, local and, uh, and federal. And we've delivered lots and lots of medical supplies. We've done sharings, particularly of the key doctors from Wuhan um, and Hangzhou that were uh, part of um, helping uh, us get through the, the epidemic in China to share what we learned with doctors all over the world. And I was uh, working hard on that to set it up with many, many Western countries. And they appreciated, the doctors appreciated the sharing. You know, what can we, what can we learn today that you've already been through? Um, and other things like AI technology in terms of COVID-19 diagnostic CT scans and stuff like that, technology which we developed because it was necessary, we've also shared that. And I think on the business customer support, we also realized that if we didn't help as a very large company with the financial capability and technology capability to help the little guys, especially the small businesses, whether it was with funding and capital at a time when the businesses were losing money, or actually helping them onboard new uh, employees and helping them find them, or new initiatives like what we call Spring Thunder, which is uh, sp taking businesses that had typically exported their products to international markets and finding buyers for those products domestically, working with um, to digitize agriculture and SMEs. These were all new initiatives that we um, that we got involved with because we realized that it would expedite or accelerate the recovery not only in China but also for our consumers and merchants outside the country. So I'm going to stop there. That sort of gives you the thumbnail sketch of, of what, who we are, what we've been doing, and, and how we've been impacted by COVID-19. I'd be delighted to take any questions that people have. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Michael. A very thorough and uh, informative session. I'm going to now introduce our uh, CEO, President and CEO, Stu Beck, who will now take questions uh, and moderate the discussion. So over to you, Stu. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Christine. Um, I just want to make sure I am unmuted. 
Nope, I'm unmuted, okay. Uh, so thank you very much, Christine and Michael. Great presentation, uh, lots of information, and I've got a, a bunch of questions myself that I've jotted down as we went through this. So I'll take the liberty of asking a couple at the front end, and I encourage people who have questions to please uh, use the chat box, uh, and uh, we'll try and get to as many as we possibly can in the time that we have remaining. Um, but Michael, just if I could uh, start uh, a couple things that are I think are important, um, and they're somewhat related, but um, I'd like to get your take on that. You mentioned that SMEs are the lifeblood of uh, the Alibaba platform, and they, of course, it's the lifeblood of Canada. I, I, different numbers get tossed around, but 96% of Canadian business is essentially SME. So I know that you have been working uh, with Canadian SMEs, to, and you mentioned companies that are on your platform already, but strategically going forward, uh, what is the Alibaba plan for Canada? How does that, gonna, how does that go to uh, shake out? I think the... We held a very big event in 2007-2008 in Toronto with Jack Ma, with uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, and with, with many, many other folks. We had, I think, uh, almost 5,000 SMEs attend. Um, and we, uh, the proposition for an SME was very clear. First of all, how do you digitize? And then how do you actually sell your products outside your local market, outside of... Uh, outside of a provincial market or even a town or a city market? And is there an interest by Chinese consumers? Since then, we've put thousands of small businesses onto our platform who sell their products directly. Um, but we would like to put many, many more Canadian SMEs onto the platform. I think the challenge in doing that, there's several challenges. First of all, you have to target the right SMEs. Our platform is not right for everyone. There are 50 million SMEs in China, only 12 million of them are on our platform. So you have to pick the SMEs that are producing products that are going to generate the consumer demand. Secondly, there are some geopolitical considerations which have slowed down our ability to, not because the government says something to us, but because Chinese consumers are more concerned about buying Canadian products based on some of the concerns that are well known in Canada and well known in China. But our commitment in North America, both to Canada and the United States, to small business and working with them uh, continues. We have a team of people in the U.S. and a team of people in Canada that continue to focus on small businesses. And we would like to continue to onboard as many as possible and get the great Canadian products sold to, uh, to China. So the corollary to that, Michael, um, and I, I'm going to park the geopolitical for a second and come back to it a little later. Um, when we've been looking at, at the foundation, looking at uh, e-commerce, and we've done three different papers uh, on this particular space in China, uh, with e-commerce in China, e-commerce in Korea, e-commerce in Japan, a couple of challenges I think that Canadian SMEs have. Logistics, how do you work this? Uh, because you're not sending container loads at times unless you're someone like Clearwater, which has uh, huge quantities of you know lobsters that they're shipping. So your thoughts around logistics, and, and I, I suppose you have support services for that. Uh, but also, uh, again, from my own experience being in, the, you know, as a Canadian Trade Commissioner in the Foreign Service and understanding how EDC works, do, you know, EDC doesn't necessarily have the instruments to support export financing uh, through e-commerce platforms. So I'm just curious on your thinking around those two issues, uh, logistics and uh, financial instruments in the domestic space. So it's an interesting question because Canada is not the only place that asks exactly that question. In fact, all countries and all SMEs, particularly to the extent that they're gonna move beyond the domestic market, wanna know how will they get their product from where they are to where it needs to go, to either a business or to a consumer. So one of the things that we've been working on, um, particularly in the last three to four years, is a, 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 a sy sy system whereby every step of the process Okay, has an application that a small business can use and that we can facilitate to help to help facilitate their ability to move that product. So let me give you an example. Uh, one of the first questions that people ask is exactly the logistics question, which is, where will I send my product? Will somebody come and pick it up or do I have to send it to a warehouse? And how do I consolidate my product? Because I've only got two boxes of, um, of soap that I want to sell. And, you know, we're not sending a whole container. So the logistics consolidation for pickup and first mile, okay, and then for long haul, and then on the other side, uh, when it gets to China, 
is a critical piece of this. And it has to be done at a scale that makes it efficient and cost effective, but it also has to be done in a way that's efficient. So you don't wait a month to move your product. And this is what we've been refining because the aggregation process of orders from small businesses actually allows this to be an efficient and scalable process. But it requires a huge amount of technology and digitization so that you know where everything is and how you're going to consolidate it and then you're, how you're going to move it. The second thing is always about how am I going to get paid? And by the way, I don't know anything about the Canadian dollar renminbi cross rate. So am I being paid in dollars or in renminbi? And do I get my money up front or do I have to deliver my product? And is there trade finance capability? How does all of that work? So you need secure financial infrastructure that supports this, including the ability to help finance this. You need secure and fast logistics. And you need to make sure that there's visibility and transparency about where the process is at any point in the continuum. And these are things that not everybody can provide. And so it costs a lot of money to create this infrastructure, to build this infrastructure. But we also understand that small businesses are not large corporation with teams of lawyers to protect their IP, with hundreds of people in their uh, procurement and sales departments. And so we have to do a lot of the heavy lifting for the businesses that want to move their products halfway around the world. And we're very happy to do it and we're doing it successfully. So I, I guess a question then for you is, is there a role for the Canadian government to help build that infrastructure for SMEs to sell onto e-commerce platforms? Could be Alibaba, could be others, or, I mean, because they have set up the toolkit in some, in many ways for through the financial side, but not necessarily on the logistical side. I mean, that's just a, a quick question there. Yeah, Canada is tricky because, you know, the vast majority of people will live within 100 miles of the U.S. border. So it's, it's, there's a thin line across the country which spreads your logistics and your aggregation capabilities out across this vast country. So it's, it's, it's much more difficult to do this than in a, a country where you have large centers of business, where you find a, an aggregation of both large and small businesses. But there is a role for government, but we don't want to become dependent on government because particularly now when government goes through a difficult time um, and, you know, deficits and, you know, and capital becomes short, we don't want that to be the limiting factor. So we're not, we're not, um, we're not constrained from a capital standpoint where we need partnership with government and where we need partnership with local organizations is to help facilitate the understanding of what we're trying to do and to have the validation and the endorsement by the government that this is a good thing and a safe thing for small businesses to do. Okay, uh, a couple of questions that have come from the audience, so I, I think we should uh, maybe approach these. Um, uh, one is, uh, what were the key challenges Alibaba faced in order to transform the crisis into an opportunity by offering digital services in order to meet the rising digital demand from uh, consumers? So what were you facing in that, in that, in that, uh, in that space? I think the, 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 biggest, the biggest challenge for us was to be able to communicate a sense of confidence that it was okay to come back to work, not for our own employees. Our own employees, we, you know, we, have a, we have lots of ways to communicate with them, and their safety was our primary goal. But we also knew that if we couldn't encourage small businesses um, to come back um, to the platform, then it would be very difficult to satisfy consumer demand. And that's why I spent a few minutes just talking about the types of things that we've done for, uh, to help small businesses get back on the platform in China. Um, outside of China, um, what you'll find if you talk to many international brands is that it's been a huge opportunity to be on the platform in China when most of their offline retail stores have been closed. And so many brands will tell you that China is the best performing part of their business this year not because there's anything extraordinary going on in China other than the fact that people are back to business, but so much of the offline retail infrastructure in North America and Europe, but also in Japan and other parts of the world is closed. And so brands are hoping that, um, and, and small businesses are hoping that the China market will be probably the largest part of their business this year and a very, very important part of their business in the future. So getting the confidence of people to come back to work is the most important thing. Oh, absolutely. And I guess it, 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 there's a logical question from that. 
What do you think about retail, walk-in retail going forward? I mean, this is something that we have to worry about here in Canada. And there, you've seen your, your China's ahead, so you must get a sense of what, you know, obviously it's good for good business for you on the digital platforms, but walk-in retail, what does that mean going forward? Or what, what, what are your thoughts about that? Well, every country will have a different set of rules and sort of stipulations for its consumers in terms of social distancing and wearing face masks. But most of those are, we think, are going to restrict the volume of traffic in stores. And we see it here in, in I'm in the United States now, but we see it in terms of offline retailers today will let two or three or four people into a, a mid-sized store, but not more. So traffic is definitely down. So then the question is, is the offline retail in its current format going to be a successful format in the future? We don't know. We don't know, but we do know that if we digitize those operations so that a consumer, instead of being in the store, can see those products and in inventory online and order online in addition to possibly going to the store, there's a much greater opportunity for that retailer to survive if the current environment continues for a long period of time and traffic, physical traffic is reduced, or to survive even if the current environment church changes very rapidly and people decide that they can go back to normal. We don't believe normal is going to return to what it was. We believe the new normal is going to be the need to digitize everything so that you always offer the consumer the choice and it doesn't, it, it doesn't have to be done and it won't be done at a great cost to the merchant. Well, I think you just answered one of the questions that popped up about consumer behavior. I, I think you're basically saying that consumer behavior is, gonna, has, is changing and, and will change going forward as a result of COVID-19. Um, the question, and this goes back to the geopolitical issue that you, you raised, and, and uh, this is, I think, important for Canadians. And uh, we're, we're investing heavily in the... In, into the digital innovation space. Uh, and I'm curious to get your thoughts around artificial intelligence. I mean, a lot of what you do is based on artificial intelligence and how that operates. And what does that mean in terms of our, our ability to collaborate uh, with you and with China in general? Do you have any thoughts on that? Because I think it's an important thing that we have to consider going forward, uh, particularly as, we, as you get into digitization, as you say, so. I think sometimes artificial intelligence is, is, is misunderstood, at least in terms of the application of it on our platform. When we have all of these consumers, 850 million consumers on the platform, the most important thing for us is to be able to personalize the app. So when you get up in the morning, if you turn on your phone and you open the app, what you're going to see is a product of your activity in our ecosystem over time and artificial intelligence or the machine learning more about you or more about me and therefore showing you things that we think will be interesting to you. And that's what we call personalization of the app. So as 846 million individuals in China open that app and 200 million outside of China open the app, they all see different things. And we're not focused on you as an individual. We're focused on you in terms of your behavior, your consumption behavior, your viewing behavior, the things that you're most interested in. So we don't want you to waste the 25 minutes that you're going to spend in our app looking at things that are being advertised by other people that we know you have no interest in. If you have an interest, you'll search and find them. We want to show you things that by your behavior indicate that this is really what you care about, whether it's news feeds, whether it's the latest movies that have come out, whether it's cool products for sports or you know, for women in cosmetics or sports or, or anything, we wanna personalize it in a way that people feel, wow, this is very cool. This is what I'm interested in. I wanna focus on this. So that's how we use it. The artificial intelligence has many other applications um, in other businesses and other sectors that we're not involved in. This is, that's how we use it. So as a collabor for, for purposes of collaboration, it's wonderful for brands. It's wonderful for consumers. The brand application is that they learn more about their consumers since we give the data from consumers to the brands so that they can learn about their consumers. And that's very helpful in terms of then how they spread their advertising and merchandising dollars on our platform.
So it doesn't matter whether you're a Chinese merchant or a Chinese consumer or an international merchant trying to sell to a Chinese consumer, artificial intelligence is serving both parties well. And just another um, kind of an aside on the geopolitical. So, because you mentioned it, are you having to adapt your strategy somewhat just because of what's happening, uh, I'll say, obviously between the China and the United States, but it's beginning to play out on a broader basis. Does that, does that factor into how you think about your, your relationships uh, outside of China uh, in particular? It's not, it's not changing our strategy. Our, we're a corporation. We're, we're not a government entity. We're a corporation. And we have a very clear strategy and a very simple uh, mission, which is to make it easy to do business for our merchants and consumers. Mm -hmm. So we stick to that mission. And whether it's our B2B business or our B2C business, we execute against it. Are we mindful of the geopolitical considerations? Yes. So what does that mean we need to do? It means we need to remember that we're a guest in countries where we're operating outside of China. Mm -hmm. Secondly, we need to be transparent about exactly what we're doing. And so I spend a lot of my time with governments and regulators and, and lots of officials discussing what is our business? What are we actually doing in your country? And then we need to try and pursue business opportunities that cater to our distinctive capability as opposed to doing things which are going to hurt domestic businesses that are already trying to do the same thing. So when I tell, told you before, the imports from North America or Canada in this case to China, that is something that we do that Canadian companies can't do. Um, and so we're not, we're not taking an opportunity away from a Canadian company by doing it. We're basically providing an opportunity to brands and small businesses that wouldn't otherwise exist. If we follow that pattern and that sort of grouping of, of, of thoughts and actions, then we feel we differentiate ourselves or we avoid being lumped into a general categorization of a Chinese technology company because people know what we're doing and they know we're making a contribution um, and there's no issue around the transparency of our, of our intent or our actions in a country. Mm -hmm. And um, this is a pretty... Um... Uh, not some bolts type question, but I think it's useful because I'm looking at the number of people that we have online that are probably interested in this. Uh, how does a Canadian company who's not part of the system, Alibaba ecosystem, how do they apply and become part of that process? Well, they certainly welcome to send me an email and I'll, uh, I'll direct them in the, uh, I'll put them in the right direction. But um, we have an office uh, in, uh, in Vancouver. We have uh, seven or eight offices in, um, in the United States. We have business development people that are speaking to both small businesses um, and working with uh, uh, both provincial and federal institutions to uh, work with small businesses. So we're, we're around and we're available and we're always interested in, listen, four years ago, we had no Canadian brands or five years ago, we had no Canadian brands on our platform and now we have more than a thousand. So we're, we're, you know, we're working hard and, and we are available, but uh, I'm certainly a good point of contact and I'm very happy to take, uh, as I said earlier, I got an email from somebody last week and I called them and we had a discussion and that's how it happens. That's the manual part that technology yeah. will not replace. We're still, uh, we're still a people driven business in that respect. And you can do it in a two dimension as opposed to three dimension. So it's uh, the reality of digitization, right? It's uh, that's the, the, the way of the future. I'm gonna have one last question from my perspective and, and then I, I'll turn it over to Christine and, and, and give you my thanks for a great session. Uh, you talked about U.S. and China and th their issues. Uh, just your thoughts on the Canada-China relationship right now, because, you know, I've been in the business for 30, almost 38 years now, and this is the, I'd say the, the nadir. I, I don't think there's been anything, and we've never been through such a time. Just your thoughts, seeing as how, as a Canadian, you know, working with a Chinese company and having, you know, a very global outlook from, from your past and your, and your uh, the jobs that you've had, just maybe it doesn't have to be uh, in depth, but just a, a general sense of uh, where you think are, where th you think things are, and where we should be doing, or what we should be doing. I think it's a very tricky situation. Um, uh, I don't think it's uh, it's Canada's managed to get itself caught between a rock and a hard place, and um, the and it's it's not one that has either a simple solution or a quick solution, um, and there's impatience in this sort of trilateral relationship 
that is defined by the issue uh, for a resolution, but it's, there, isn't a, there isn't an obvious place to go. But it requires an enormous amount of work at the, uh, at the geopolitical level between the leadership of the countries to try and find a resolution. And, and until that happens, I think it's going to be quite tense. Quite tense. Yeah. I, I agree. And I think uh, the fact that we still have engagement uh, at the commercial level is important. I mean, allows people like you, my, like me and others to, to talk and message uh, to say this is really not in either one of our uh, country's best interest and how do we come up with some sort of resolution going forward. So I, I, I agree it's a difficult time. Um, but uh, Michael, thank you very much for taking the time where it, uh, you know, almost uh, come to a complete end here. Um, you know, you know, Alibaba and what it has to offer Canadian companies is fantastic. Uh, the way you've, you've laid this out, uh, you know, the future of retail has changed as you as you've raised. So I think uh, we're in a situation now that uh, understanding the digital space, understanding how it can be your friend, how it can be your uh, revenue generator. This is all part of that that process of uh, a 21st century economy and. And I'm hoping, I hope I can say that Canada in many ways has some leadership in this space and I hope we can take advantage of it. So again, thank you very much for being able to lay all this out for us and to be able to have a good chat. Uh, and I'd like to remind people that this is on, uh, on the, our, will be on our website uh, if you want to capture, uh, capture it. Um, and Chris, I'm going to just turn it over to you and, and let you have the final word. And, uh, and again, thank you, Michael, for everything that you've done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stu, and thank you very much, Michael. I just wanted to say a couple of words because I know that Alibaba is involved in this. Uh, I've been talking to the uh, World Trade Center in Toronto, and um, they have this program which is called the Market Activation Program, and because they can't physically facilitate trade missions right now overseas, um, they've asked me to mention that they're going to be running a virtual trade mission with uh, um, a number of uh, Asian um, e-commerce platforms, including Alibaba. So um, if you want more information about this, you're, I know that we have a lot of SMEs on online today. Uh, please do contact the World Trade Center to um, uh, find out more about it. And the dates are generally uh, in, gen uh, there's two sessions one from July 21st to the 24th, and another one from July 27th to the 30th. And Alibaba will have representatives there, so if you want to know more about it, um, they'd be happy to help you out. So please do check out their website or contact Toronto Regional Board of Trade. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a pleasure, and I hope everybody enjoyed the session as much as we did. And again, many thanks to you, Michael, and thank you, Stuart. Thank you, Pierre. And have a good day. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Bye-bye.